Welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you. I thought we could start by really just arriving in our bodies and in the space. I hear some good sighs going on. We can let our breath feel free and invite it a, a bit deeper into the belly through the inhale. And then allow the exhale to extend slowly. Just three more breaths, extending intentionally the inhale, letting the belly fill and rise. And gently and slowly exhaling as the belly button comes back towards the spine. And then find the natural rhythm of breath. And invite a softening through the face and the chest and the belly. And feel and imagine the strength and the dignity of the spine holding us up. And begin by just welcoming whatever is here. Welcoming any heaviness or fatigue in the body. Welcome, welcoming the heartbreak, the anger, and the residue maybe of cycling feelings through the day. And this subtle but important shift of how we welcome. Welcoming not from the pain body, the body of contraction and identification, rumination, but welcoming from loving awareness, loving presence. And for some of us, sitting quietly feels really hard, draining. And for others, it's a refuge wherever you are. For a couple more moments, let's just together find this loving presence and welcome whatever experience is here. As needed, feel free to allow the exhale through the mouth to help titrate the energy, release, calm, soothe the nervous system. for just a bit longer as we welcome ourselves fully to the space feel the invitation that you don't need to know right now 
You don't need to understand, you don't need to fix, you just need to be with whatever is here, with the deepest part of who you are, loving awareness. And without shifting or changing from this loving awareness, this presence of love, we just gently come into the room together. I won't ring a bell because it's not a practice we're ending. And as feels comfortable, blinking the eyes back open, Welcome again, everyone. I'm really grateful to be here together. Many of you know Noam, and Noam texted me, who's very involved here in the Dharma Collective, helps us show up here, and he said, Thanks for holding everyone tonight. I was like, "Uh uh-uh. We are holding each other. So I'm really happy to be holding with you all. You know, (laughs) I mean, like, truly the Dharma is meant for times like these. And it's really interesting because it can be, it can be, I know myself, I can have some resistance to using the Dharma to move quickly through the heartbreak, to not let myself actually feel, you know, the realness of pain and of fear and of a world that has really changed overnight and not in a metaphoric way, right? There is less safety for many people today. And, um, There is a lot of deep uncertainty. And yet what we know is there will be more difficulty and more pain. And so holding that heartbreak and holding the uncertainty, that's always the Dharma. But today it's just like this other level and this other layer of invitation. And I think that you know, the opportunity to be with the heartbreak together is such a rich one. We just are coming on the heels of the Dia de los Muertos altar. So many of us here supported. And um, it seems in some ways like apocryphal or symbolic, right? We laid out with so much beauty and so many flowers, this welcoming. And then it was covered with grief. Right, so literally the altar was inches thick with people's remembrances of what has been lost. And I think our practice is like that. You know, we kind of make this body, heart, and mind the most beautiful flower-filled altar that we can invite the grief into and that we can hold the grief in. And this, you know, this simple but really profound instruction you know, I was mentioning from Wangyal Rinpoche that there is different ways we can host our experience that don't require us to feel anything different than we're feeling. And we can host the experience from what he calls the pain body. And that's not just, you know, physical pain, right? That pain body is the way that we contract around 
difficult emotions and experiences, the way we over identify with difficult emotions and experiences. And that can create this kind of, you know, stuck and desiccated feeling uh, with the emotions. And then hosting from a greater space, you know, in some ways from the loving space of bodhicitta, from the awakened heart, we still feel the heartbreak and the anger. And yet there's like, there's something that's a little bit bigger. It's truly the, the difference between holding in openness and holding in contraction. And it's a way I think we can experience the, the difficulty and the heartbreak, but without the full collapse and despair. And there may be people here tonight for whom there isn't despair and heartbreak. It's also welcome. And it's interesting to try to hold each other where we are. I've had so many instances today of connecting with people I care about and being on different wavelengths. Like I'm deep in the sorrow and wanting to cry and someone's ready to start strategizing and I'm like, I'm not here for it. And then I'm feeling a little better and someone's heavy and I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> like I'm feeling good for a moment. Like let's not go there. And I think to give ourselves the deep grace to be where we are and to be with each other where we are. Um, it's such a training ground. It's such a training ground. And I think um, maybe needless to say, but this pain and this sadness that many of us are carrying and cycling through, just like all those notes on the altar they are a reflection of our love, you know, our deep care and compassion. And uh, on Saturday night at the altar, one of our community members, uh, Grace, was there. And right at the moment, I was looking at the altar and I said, it's overwhelming. She said, yes, the love is overwhelming. And I was like, thank you, Grace. I needed that slight reframe, right? Because I was, I was going into that sense of, um, you know, I think grief can have a very narrow passage when it's kind of personal and self-related. And then there's also this place of grief that is so vast, endless. It's not less sad, but it's less tight. And um, as I've mentioned before, Chogyam Trumpa, he calls this the unconditioned heart of genuine sorrow. And there's such a, it's like an inevitable part of the spiritual journey to be able to connect with and in some ways rest in that unconditioned heart of genuine sorrow. It's a way of being completely raw and naked with the suffering that is this world. And, you know, most of us get so busy and full that we can kind of avoid it here and there. Maybe it wakes us up in the middle of the night. Maybe we have a day or two, but like we can really move through. And um, to feel the rawness of it and to work with it, as I said, I don't want to push us into doing or striving and how do we alchemize, but just to really see and feel and honor what's being offered by life. My teacher says in this beautiful way, the greatest generosity we can have with life is receiving what life is offering to us with a deep bow and the kind of fighting against like it shouldn't be this way is not fully receiving. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be this way, right? Like, doesn't mean we want it to be this way, but just how do we receive what life is offering? It's, it's a really important area for our practice and for our compassion too. And so in this loving awareness, I, I really want us to 
feel and sense the presence of it within us. And I don't want to assume that that's necessarily easy to access at this moment. So I wanted to spend a moment before we do a deliberate practice of loving awareness to get a sense of what that means. We've been moving through this beautiful text and we'll kind of revisit some greatest hits tonight because this text is entirely dedicated to living with an open heart when the world is on fire. We are here. And um, it is hard to keep the heart open. It really requires quite, quite not only the skill, the discipline, but it actually requires that we are together doing this, holding each other, witnessing each other, and reminding ourselves over and over of why, right? So holding the heart open while the world is on fire isn't a nice thing we should do. It is like truly the only option because the alternatives are succumb to despair. That really is depleting, overwhelming, we're unavailable to others, kind of get lost in rage completely understandable, but in the same way, even more depleting, still unavailable to others. Try to numb out completely. It doesn't work. The pain gets in anyway, right? So there's this way that like the only sane option is to become a warrior of compassion. And it's been said that, you know, this great Buddha of compassion has more arms than we can imagine. And that the way our compassion can live through the world or get enacted in the world has so many creative ways. So we don't have to, as warriors of compassion, just get tight and serious, like we can laugh. We can have pizza and popcorn, as we did last night here, some of us trying to stave off the inevitable. But there's this way that the worldview of the bodhisattva, of the warrior of compassion, it's in some ways even more supportive than any of the practices. The orientation towards suffering, orientation towards the difficulty of the world. And the bodhisattva, really, that orientation is so beautifully described, being available and making this vessel one that is true, that is tuned, like an instrument that can be played beautifully. And so in that way, though we all know the suffering that might be coming or the suffering that is even here today, we recognize the value of nurturing the self, nurturing our own heart, nurturing our own mind along the way. And the loving awareness is, it's not necessarily kind of this elated feeling. It really is like infused sense of awareness that is the natural state of our care. And you can look at, you know, some of the studies that folks have done and early development and early life, and you see that there is an inborn sense of care. It's very easy to look at this world right now and to think, well, there's just so much bad and so much hatred. And yet there is at just this fundamental core level, so much goodness and so much love. And it is, of course, an everyday choice of what we feed and what we strengthen. And when we start to choose to see and to feel and to live into loving awareness, it builds its own momentum. It's not something we have to like, oh, I really have to like engage this loving awareness so that it can hold me. Like it's just there. And it can for hours, maybe even days, feel far away. I heard from a number of, of close friends today who are beautiful warriors of compassion on the path that they felt like, I don't even know what my practice is doing. Like, I can't, 
like there's it's not working that's natural right like how can we not feel at times overwhelmed and consumed and then in that case you know like leaning back almost relaxing into surrendering dissolving into the loving awareness because after all the tears and the anger in that state of exhaustion this really kind of simple mammalian form that we get to inhabit is really infused with a sense of love and care and i'd like to hear from folks like how have you if you have today experienced loving awareness even with all the other ups and downs of emotion experiences what does it feel like in the body what does it feel like in how you're observing the world <clears throat> i think it would be helpful to kind of name and identify it before we go into a little practice with it i actually don't know where the mic is oh there it is okay do you want to kick us off since you have it any glimmer of loving awareness today yes uh i will um i i'm in chandra's intro to buddhist tantra class mm. and she's left a lot of beautiful chants um in the like main drive and so oh you have to speak a little louder oh sorry um <clears throat> I'm in Chandra's Intro to Buddhist Tantra class, and she's left a lot of beautiful chants in the box. So she left one of um, Saraswati mm. poem and um, her reciting it and with the tampura in the background. Mm. Uh, and so that with the, the mantras reciting uh, throughout the day and yesterday yeah. have really brought the awareness a little hmm. more available so that i think there's just been a little more like a, a courage or strength lying there than previously noticed you know yeah. before <laughs> or that it comes in and out throughout the day but there have been glimpses and the mantra i think was has been really helpful hmm. and the chanting has been really nice beautiful thank you Anybody else? Glimmers of loving awareness? Yes. Um, wait, wait, one moment for the, yep. Um, a lot of people were sending things around, um, but one was um, some people that I was canvassing with, we were sing they were singing in the car, and one of the songs that I keep, it just now it's running through my head, but the first line is, put one foot in front of the other, put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. So I've just been hmm. going through my head. <laughs> yeah it's helped me a lot get through the day <laughs> beautiful yeah another mantra and many of you may know mantra means mind protector right it's like a shield you know using these words that can help us um, kind of infuse the mind with that protection um, of beautiful words and intention yes Arta in the back <laughs> Um, as an immigrant from Ukraine, very much feeling all the feelings today. Yeah. But also it's been so beautiful because the mantra we received from you, mm -hmm. bow deeper, yeah. has been such a profound inspiration for me. And today was also beautiful, the depth of connection I felt with very dear friends who are also feeling all the feelings and then together to be in that authenticity. I, I really felt the power of that today mm. and this deep sense of unity and very much connecting to the, this, this collective strength of being in it mm. together. So um, um, bowing deeper. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And it is, you know, it's interesting, like loving awareness, it's us and it's, it's in connection, right? 
there is no th I, I've said this before, but like there's no such thing as individual well being. It's a fantasy. Right. And I think really it's, it is, you know, so palpable. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Anyone else, especially like what does what's the experience of loving awareness? What is it like in the body? If you felt it. Yes. Thanks, Cage. Um, I came here to sit in the morning because morning was really, really hard yeah. for me. Like I went to sleep early yesterday and this morning is just like a little overwhelming. And I was debating going to ocean or come to sit and it felt too cold. So I came here first thing in the morning to sit. And then after the sitting, I, me and another Sangha friend, we went to Timo to grab coffee. So I witnessed a lot of his tears and we were just sitting silently um, and kind of creating space for emotions. And I forgot during what time of the day I was just on the fly doing Tanglen. Hmm. And then naturally I kind of brought him into my mind, mm. like his tears become my tear. It's it's not a formal sitting practice, but yeah. it kind of just comes on naturally, but the body feels very tender and yeah. it's still very soft and fuzzy, but it also feels strong at the same time, mm. like weirdly beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that, you know, on the spot ability to kind of breathe in and, and really feel and kind of welcome, right, that there's our, our own distress and suffering for some of us. Um, and then the recognition of others known and unknown, um, for whom today creates a lot of fear, uncertainty, pain, worry, risk, threat. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I noticed for myself uh, a resistance to loving awareness for a couple hours. I just wanted to be, I wanted to be in my heartbreak without any, anything in between it. And then I realized like, well, yeah, loving awareness was there. It just was like sitting with it was really was really tricky. Like I had to just kind of hold myself in this way. And it's very <clears throat> interesting. I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but the kind of posture when our heart feels tender, like how we literally hold ourselves. And as I was walking through the city and I noticed, I mean, the city was quiet. You know, felt like everyone kind of holding themselves close. Um, and yet, you know, feeling the glimmer in the body of, of loving presence or loving awareness. Yes, I can't see who that is, but. It's Maria. Hey there. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hey. Oh. Um, so I'm up here in Seattle, um, and today I I have a bonsai business, and I decided to have a 50% off sale, um, <laughs> and so people could connect uh, in that way. And one of my customers came in, and coincidentally, he bought a really great treat that's name is Quincy Jones. I don't know if you know that we lost Quincy Jones uh, recently. Um, but it was such a beautiful connection point. And he said that he came, you know, because he was feeling sad and he, he wasn't planning even to get a tree. He actually left with two trees. Um, <laughs> and it was like, so cool to see him come and then leave. He was smiling when he left and what it did for me was it made me realize how you know what 
these one of these beautiful um, side effect of crisis sometimes, you know, that causes yeah. people to come together and really like look at each other and hold each other's hearts in this. And um, so I see, you know, so clearly, obviously what the work is now, but it's just, I, I see what's, what's to come, at least for those of us who are, uh, have the opportunity to come together over this and um, maybe an unexpected side effect from those who um, would maybe have us be divisive um, that sometimes mm -hmm. stuff like this makes us actually come together. So yeah. just wanted to share that. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. I didn't know how sad I was. Mm -hmm. And now I'm feeling the sadness. It's of course what, what happened yesterday, but it's more, much more, more, more than that. Mm -hmm. It's what happening in other countries and people that I love there. And, and also missing my parents mm. they are not here already quite a long time mm. well i have been having them so near me so close to me uh, from a few days to now mm. and uh, i was loved i didn't know it <laughs> but now I know, <laughs> and I, I think that love made not a bad person from me. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I, I really think this mingling of the, for some of us, the Dia de los Muertos and inviting in that remembrance of love and loss, and then really kind of getting the strong reminder of the suffering that's all over the world, right? And I woke up interestingly, and I, I, I wished I could call my mom, right? Uh, who's been passed for a number of years now. And, uh, and I, guess, I guess it is that like, that desire for comfort being held. And uh, so beautiful to kind of recognize as you describe that there has been love. And I think loving awareness um, and this ability to kind of feel the presence of love within us as the deepest dimensional quality of us. It's a real, <clears throat> it's a real, un, it's a real, it can be a challenge in these times, but I also think it's closer to the surface than ever. Because when we're in times of joy and celebration or even just busyness and, you know, in the flow, the outside world seems to be offering us what we're feeling. That's what's happening. And so to really, when the outside world is offering us fear and sadness and frustration, and to feel that presence of love, it's, um, yeah, it's such a beautiful gift. And the, <clears throat> you know, the heartbreak of not living in the world that we want to be living in, right? Not living in the world of justice that we want to be living in, not living in the world of compassion we want to be living in. Um, it is also like it does point directly at just this yearning and desire to be in a place where there <clears throat> is reflected all around us the values of love and compassion and care. Um, it's a yearning that reminds me a lot of the yearning for awakening. It's so bittersweet, right? Like I really want to see this world reflect goodness, care, connection. I really want to see myself completely free of everything in the way of goodness, care, and connection. So there's something beautiful about that yearning. 
um, and something motivating, as Maria suggested, um, to really recognize the opportunity. So I want to take us into a practice of loving awareness. And my invitation will be that we kind of use loving awareness as a basis to welcome emotions more specifically. So some of you are familiar with the handshake practice kind of meeting more explicitly what emotions are here but finding this kind of this host or this this body of love this presence of love and really experiencing that at the somatic level it's okay if it feels subtle but to try to move it from the conceptual and the imaginal into the embodied Finding a posture that feels supportive. Let's start this practice by welcoming in the loving awareness and presence that's all around us. So feeling the loving presence of this air perfectly designed to support us. How fortunate we are that at this moment, we can gently breathe in the air that is surrounding us. Each breath a renewal, each breath a bridge to this natural world that so deeply loves us. Feeling the loving presence of the ground beneath us. Which, other than occasional tremors, truly is solid, stable, supportive. Can we even feel or imagine gravity as a loving embrace holding us to this earth, allowing us to be steady, upright, And then allowing ourselves to bring our attention and awareness in the body completely. Filling the body with attention and awareness just as we would fill a vase completely with water. And feeling the body from within the body.
Feeling the body with the presence of loving awareness. Breathing in, feeling the whole body breathing in, breathing out, feeling the whole body breathing out. In the presence of loving awareness in the body, it could be quite subtle. Maybe it's a sense of gentle ease or warmth. Maybe a feeling of surrender. Inviting the possibility that being present in the body is infused with love. Gently shifting and expanding to bring loving awareness to the mind and the contents of the mind. Of course, thoughts and memories and images arise. Can we feel or imagine them arising out of loving awareness? And returning back into loving awareness.
And finding the heart. And experiencing how body, mind, and heart can all have this infusion of loving awareness. Even as different sensations arise or different thoughts, memories, or images arise, it's as though we keep pulling back the veils, looking deeper and deeper finding that there's no barrier, no boundary. Loving awareness can permeate the body, the mind, the heart, the space all around us, between us. And with this, as the host, this vast expanse of loving awareness, we can invite again whatever emotions are here and inviting them not as the story per se, but as the pure experience of energy Inviting our sorrow. Noticing what is the form of its feeling wave within us. Where do we feel it and how do we feel it? And giving it all the space it needs. If the story comes, the worry or the ache, no problem. But just keep trying to come back to the raw, pure experience of the emotion. And sensing what is holding the emotion, this larger expanse of loving awareness. What is the quality or feeling wave of sadness?
And if it's quite palpable, no problem, keep making space. If it's not, if it feels diffuse or not present, no problem. Just keep deeply feeling into the quality and sensations of the body. And while not needing to rush the sadness, just notice who else might be here. Could be fear, anxiety, frustration. Again, no need for stories, just making space and room for these felt palpable sensations. And even in a tired, weary body, heart and mind, Seeing if we can open and soften and open and soften. How gentle, how loving can we be with whatever is here? As much as possible, not judging whatever is arising, whether it's distraction or fixation, whether loving awareness feels right here and intimate like our own breath or diffuse and far away. Whatever arises, just bring love to it. Ongoing practice. Whether in this room or online, feeling that sense of collective practice. Just 
this loving awareness that isn't just us, but which is between us. And whether it feels like a spark or a flame in the heart, remembering that this spark or flame, this illumination of the heart, this is a gift and offering it up to all the beings who so need light in this moment. really feel like the refuge of the more than human world, animals, nature, who don't know about what's happening. It's it's quite beautiful, quite a refuge. I want to read this little passage. Um, Pema Chodron saying, Bodhisattvas practice in the middle of the fire. This means they enter into the suffering of the world. It also means they stay steady with the fire of their own painful emotions. They neither act them out or repress them. They're willing to stay right on the dot and explore an emotion's ungraspable qualities and fluid energies and let that experience link them to the pain and courage of others. And yeah, I would, I'd love to hear from folks Um, any reflections on connecting with loving awareness and inviting emotions in from that place. Um, This includes, you know, I, I, I obviously love meditation. It's not always able to give us what we need and the acuity of heartbreak in certain times. So also welcoming, you know, the sense of, wow, I really couldn't feel my heart. I couldn't invite anything in. Just would love to hear from folks. Yeah, anything they noticed or wanted to share or any questions about holding emotions with loving awareness. Hey, Eve. Hi. Hi. Nice to see Sorry you. Sorry to startle you. No problem. That's you. Good. Yeah. You need to keep these on. Um, so, um, you know, range of emotions. Um, but what came to me before you started um, the practice and that kept coming up through me during the practice was um, something Stephen Hay said, um, the uh, um acceptance and commitment therapy guys, Dr. Hayes, um, that um, hurt 
at its root is pointing us to what we care about. Mm -hmm. And, and I kept um, thinking about that and about welcoming the pain and the hurt as a Mm -hmm. gift Mm -hmm. to help me focus on what I, I care about and how I can interact with that as I move forward. Um, Mm -hmm. And I found that really, I still feel it um, important. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's such a a delicate place. Um, Alchemizing and finding the gift of our painful emotions is definitely where we want to head. And staying with just the rawness of them as they are is also so precious without making it okay. You know, there's such a, a razor's edge there. Um, and especially, right, for those of us on a spiritual path, I'm, some of you may know this term, the AFOG, uh, another fucking opportunity of growth. <laughs> and you're like, like, and there's this, you know, this like kind of like, it can inadvertently become a suppression tactic, right? And I get, you know, again, like I think about my friends who are really dedicated on the path and this idea of like, I shouldn't feel so heartbroken. I'm a practitioner. Like I should be able to like metabolize this, like done, I'm in the streets tonight. And and we don't have to. And it's so beautiful, Elizabeth, if like we feel it naturally comes to us, but to not put that expectation and as we know with grief, like non-linear. So maybe tomorrow you're like, all right, like I feel active, I'm in my community, I'm engaged, I'm in, out there. And then Sunday you're like, fuck, like it's so bad. And like, <laughs> I mean, I am committed to watching less news now because of what's gonna be in the news. But there's, this is, we are in this for a marathon. Right. Um, I do think there will be moments of reprieve and and beautiful instances where we see what it's like for people to come together and stand up and um, just being here tonight. You know, there is nothing more radical in the face of, um, I mean, in general, capitalism than communities of care, right? Like that's really, and I love the the glimmer I have of like, wow, what what does that mean for us here? We get to decide that and create that. Um, but it is it's such a it's such a tricky one. This idea of yeah, how to how to make how and when to make the um, the polishing of our emotion like a shining gem. And when to let it be like just that ruggedness of felt experience. Thank you. Yeah, and get you. And then Elizabeth, we'll come back to you in one moment. We just have one hand in the room. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Um, the feeling of loving awareness, or kind of the question that you had asked us, like, how does it feel in our body? And I was thinking of warmth or um, like an opening of hope or inspiration and I have um, a child in my life that's very dear who Mm. is non-binary and um, their mom was reading them a poem and the poem started off there's like a whole like slew of if he wins then and the reflection Mm. was how does that make you feel and they were like I'm inspired because the sun will shine tomorrow Hmm. and the fact that there can be inspiration in the sun shining yeah over and over again um, it's very touching and a reminder of loving awareness yeah thank you yeah I actually similarly interestingly I often feel like 
when I find myself in loving awareness, it's that feeling of moving from, especially like right now, this time of year, like when you're in the shadow, like it's cold, like you need a blanket or jacket and you step in the sun and it's like, oh, you know, and that ease and that openness, right? Like again, it's that exact thing. Like when we're cold, everything kind of tucks in and then that openness and warmth. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's really inspiring, especially when young folks are uh, feeling hopeful, too. Yeah, Chris. Well, what Elizabeth said reminds me of an Alex, Alec Baldwin quote that I heard recently. They have to cling to their anger. Mm. Otherwise, they would have to face their pain. Mm. And so this whole thing is like, this is this is so not good news. But it is such important information mm. that there are degrees of suffering out there that I, I had no idea. Yeah. And so I think that let's let's try healing them first. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I had just, I'm sorry, um, wanted yeah. to follow up the Stephen Hayes, um, the quote that I was, was, was um, working with. Um, it's actually about like sitting in the emotion. Um, because mm. what he says is when we other are hurt and make it bad and wrong, we are othering what we care about mm. and, and rejecting it. And the yeah. cost of doing that is too high. And so it's important to like welcome the pain and sit with it and not try to pretend it's not there and really yeah. with the big feeling. Um, yeah. So sorry, I just wanted to clarify because I didn't, I, I just, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, it is so interesting. This also what Chris brought up is like, what do, like what is revealed by the you know the culture war that's going on in our country right and how that's playing out on a political stage it's a lot of pain and suffering a lot of fear and i think you know sitting in uncertainty and fear whew, it is not something any of us love to do it doesn't come naturally i think it's um, at the root and source of so much kind of neurotic preoccupation and um, avoidance and difficulty. And kind of like at a very basic level, there is this threat, a survival level threat that can create so much intensity um, and energy. And to understand it and to kind of move back down the chain, as you're saying, Chris, of Let's really understand it as anger. Let's understand it as pain. Let's understand it as fear. Um, yeah, it's 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 really humanizing to recognize the emotions that are rampant uh, across everything. I'd like to add to that list ignorance. It's not an emotion, but yes. <laughs> And I think, you know, again, <laughs> when we get into the territory of ignorance, judgment comes in. And though I completely hear where you're coming from, you know, just when we recognize that emotions completely overwhelm our conscious awareness, they hijack us, as Danny Goleman would say, and they make it difficult for us to see, that can create ignorance, right? Because we're just not seeing clearly. But when we are like directing ignorance towards another, there is a, a judgment in there, which we're welcome to have judgments, but the judgment can really get in the way. Um, yes, Daniel. This whole question of, I, I mean, I think that what I'm thinking about is what you're talking about, loving mm -hmm. presence. It's something, and, and please tell me if it's not, uh, because it's something that, informs most of my practice, which is some, a lot of which is some kind of a combination of handshake practice and mm. the three doors. And this 
playing with the way that I think about it is like inside out versus outside in. Mm. Meaning, when do I try to create the conditions, you know, of that will make it feel safe enough or embodied enough or comfortable enough in order to shake hands with difficult body sensations mm. versus when do I go straight to the body sensations as a way to then let like my you know that that by by just being with them going inside out that from there allowing things to relax and then adding to that at times trying to playing with finding that loving place so you know because i remember before i even joined a sangha i i i remember saying you know i'm tired of running from my anxiety i'm just going to go and sit with it mm. and i and i literally went to a park and sat with it and it was just dis, it was just pain and discomfort because and i realized more recently that there, that's because there, there was no love there mm. to to be with it mm. and so so adding to that when do i and the way that i visualize it is like a flower when do i try and like let that open so that in order to make in order to make it okay so i'm not just sitting with pain yeah so those are the the i guess the two different ways or that i contemplate it and work with it in my practice beautiful yeah, and, you know, um, happily, that is described in the traditions, you know, that there, there is not one way. And just as you were saying, it's kind of, you know, sometimes that flower of our heart, that gentleness, it's like the invitation for what's difficult to arise naturally, even, right, and in our practice, where we can kind of really generate that field of loving presence and then the emotions. But sometimes we go right to it. And when we go right to it, especially without the story, just in the pure experiencing of it, it really will dissolve. And then loving presence is there. So I think there's the both and. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think, you know, I'll speak for myself, but both of these practices can be hard when we are just run down emotionally, you know, and feel that sense of depletion. And that might be where, you know, the, the physicality I was mentioning, the like actual holding of ourself, like this is a great posture, but like this is a great posture too. So we sometimes need just the, the kind of tactile um, sense of care. And I would even, so I heard someone call this the humble yogi. I don't know if that's actually accurate, but like this posture, right? Which I think of just as like emo. Um, <laughs> but that like true, like tucking in so that, you know, outer circumstances that support us can include like a real like holding um, of ourselves. If we're lucky and someone else can hold us even it's just it's it's really helpful for those emotions, as you mentioned, that sometimes they need love around them. Otherwise, it's just sitting in in the pain. And the love, you know, it's, yeah, we can talk about this um, another time as well. But like this idea of what allows us to sit just in discomfort, and then what allows us to sit in discomfort infused with love. Right. And how does that happen in our practice? Um, it's such a good inquiry. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to share a couple more. Um, so many of us have been here as we are working through <clears throat> the text of the Bodhisattva way of life. And it's, <laughs> it's really such a beautiful path, no matter what. I think for the coming years and months, like even maybe more so, because in some ways it really helps us build like this a deep inner refuge within our own heart. And 
you know, I love the term refuge. I think it's, it just has such a resonance. And even I remember the first time I heard it before I'd really become indoctrinated with the Buddhist terminologies and words, like so beautiful, <clears throat> a place where we can feel protected and at ease, a refuge, and that our true refuge can be found within. And in the guide to the Bodhisattva, like really the, this, quality of bodhicitta, this quality of the awakened heart, is such a refuge. Also called, you know, like he, there's, as you might remember, two chapters describing how amazing bodhicitta actually is, how it is this incomparably valuable jewel, how no matter where it is planted, whether it's in garbage or in a stream or on top of a mountain, like wherever we can find that sense of deep care, like it will it will glisten and glimmer through um, so it's it is this sense that when we infuse the mind with a sense of care for others our experience of life is so much more beautiful enlivened purposeful meaningful and authentic um, and i think that this uh, this world view of it that bodhicitta, if it does become something we experience as so meaningful, um, we can start to recognize that we can experience it everywhere. Like everything is an opportunity to develop our bodhicitta, both when we're experiencing something enjoyable uh, and when we're experiencing something difficult. And so there's this passage here In bodhicitta training, we learn to use whatever pain or fear we experience to open our hearts to other people's distress. In this way, our personal misery doesn't close us down. It becomes a stepping stone toward a bitter, bigger perspective. Each day, we're either strengthening or weakening our negative patterns. Um, and as Trungpa Rinpoche would say, karma is not punishment. It's the consequences that we are we're temporarily stuck with, we can undo it by following the path. And in this um, section of the Guide to the Bodhisattva, he's really talking about how bodhicitta is there unconditionally for us until the day that we die. And that actually practicing in bodhicitta prepares us for the greatest groundlessness of our life, which is which is the, which is death. And um, she says here, the best possible preparation for dying is to recognize the nature of mind. In watching people die, I've observed death can be a strong support for waking up. Everything is naturally falling apart, our body falling apart, our way of perceiving reality is falling apart. Everything we've clung to is dissolving. The letting go that we've cultivated during our life is happening naturally. This is what we've wanted, and now it's occurring on our own. For those who spend their lives learning to relax with groundlessness, death is liberating. But if we live our lives trying to hold on to this brief and transient existence, we're going to be scared. Death is the ultimate unknown we are forever avoiding, the ultimate groundlessness we try to escape. But if we learn to relax with uncertainty and insecurity, death is a support for joy. And I feel like that, that passage, especially today, because a lot of what some of us may be experiencing is that sense of groundlessness, that sense of what now? Like I thought I kind of understood how things could, should, or would be, and now there's no ground. And this idea of relaxing into the groundlessness, partially because we know that all of it is fuel for the fire, right? That, um, and this is what Elizabeth was pointing to, that we, we can look at these difficult experiences, if not as a, a gift, as a crucible training ground for us. Um, I think that the way, I think that the way that we learn to be with ourselves right in the middle of these emotions is the entire 
bodhisattva path here. Um, one moment. Yeah, right in the middle of our foulest emotions, we find a precious gem. In the middle of confusion and reactivity, we find bodhicitta. Our most difficult emotions can serve as a basis for compassion. So this idea that, especially if our emotions arise, um, how do we work with them and transform them? If maybe transform feels a little too strong, see them as a way to more deeply connecting with the care that lies beneath them or that what it reveals to us that we value so deeply. And I know this is, uh, again, it's kind of that AFOG thing where we can too quickly push towards making the difficult emotions the next thing we have to do or like our responsibility or, um, but it really is, um, such training for the rest of our life and in the next chapters to come in the guide to the bodhisattva way of life it moves on from attention training and being with difficult emotions into the discipline um, and into the care and the virtue that we can really start embracing as we're walking through the fire of difficult emotions and walking through the fire of uncertainty with so clearly in mind our dedication to being of service to all beings. And that's, it's such a strange thing that what can help us pull out of overwhelm is thinking about how many other people need to be pulled out of overwhelm. But it's really that, that simple, that motivation that helps us pull out. And I wanted to uh, remind us of these vows. They're so beautifully um, described. And the idea with these vows, just like with prayers or mantra that was described earlier, is that when we start to kind of feel not just the words, but the essence of the words, that it can start to shift and change the heart in different ways. And these vows are the vows that His Holiness the Dalai Lama and, and many others every single day, right? Like I'm sure they're memorized. They don't really need to say them. They've, you know, kind of felt them and cultivated them so deeply in the heart. But the idea that saying them every day makes them feel connected to this vow. It's, it's an inspiring way to help us keep motivated, um, and keep ourselves moving forward. And so the vows here, May I be a guard for those who are protectorless, a guide for those who journey on the road. For those who wish to go across the water, may I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. May I be an island for those who yearn for landfall, a lamp for those who long for light. And for those who need a resting place or a bed, may, uh, may I be their bed. For those who need a servant, may I serve. May I be the wishing jewel, the vase of plenty, a word of power and the supreme healing. May I be a tree of miracles for every being, an abundant source. Like the earth and pervading elements enduring as the sky itself endures for boundless multitudes of living beings. May I be their ground and sustenance. Thus for everything that lives, as far as are the limits of the sky, may I provide their livelihood and nourishment until they pass beyond the bonds of suffering. And as, as we've talked about before, this is like an outrageous vow, right? For every single being who is suffering, for as long as space remains, may I dedicate myself to be exactly what they need. But there's such a, a dignity in that aspiration. And the aspiration is truly meant to kind of exercise, expand and open the heart past what we think is possible and to hold in mind that view. And in this very moment of groundlessness, there's also boundless suffering. And it's, it's interesting to kind of hold the fact of groundlessness and not knowing 
feel that there is a refuge within and then find the openness to be available for others. And I think we just are gonna cycle through that over and over and over, right? Like, I have no idea what's going on. I don't understand it and I don't know what will happen. I feel the presence of loving awareness within me. I am here for the sake of all beings for all time. I think that feels to me, you know, one of the ways that these thousands of years of teachings has made its way through because it's completely sane. And not just sane, like it's a noble and beautiful way to live life. And to be able to kind of move through and do what needs to be done. Because tomorrow and next week and the months to come, we all have to keep doing the work we are doing and maybe more. So with that, let's take a couple moments and reconnect. feeling and welcoming whatever is here in the body. Allowing whatever uncertainty is here to be fully here. When there is groundlessness, there's no agenda or ambition. We let ourselves be completely down on the ground with our experience. Notice if that glimmer, that warmth, that sunlight of loving awareness is also here. And whatever glimmer of light we feel we hold in the heart, placing our hands together in front of the heart. And the symbolic gesture of offering this light dedicating our practice that all beings could know the light within them that all beings could feel safe and at ease and dedicating our practice that all beings could know love and belonging that all beings could find freedom. May all beings of all time, as long as space remains, be free. feel super grateful for you all being here. So humbling to try and support this space in this enormous day and time. And just, yeah, really beautiful to be here with you all. And hope we can care for each other and care for ourselves. And keep coming back. And I, I really do it takes such heart in our community and um, feel it is a shining light. So, yeah, thank you so much.